Bienvenidos, uh, welcome to our last panel of this colloquium, I'm sorry. Yeah. But um, it's been it's been quite a quite a, a wonderful a wonderful conversation across the Pacific and um, the way that we're closing the, the the colloquium is very special because we'll be talking about indigenous cultures and indigenous language and um, indigenous philosophies and uh, here I have with me a book that has been has been a, a, in my life for a long time and this this book by Miguel Leon Portilla, Philosophia Nahuatl. Uh, and this is perhaps in a way a tribute to this, this wonderful scholar uh, who, who was a, a pioneer you know, in the study of um, indigenous philosophy in Latin America. So, so I pay tribute to him. And we are very, very fortunate to have here um, a crucial Watane, and, and she's going to give us the, the perspective of Maori philosophy, maybe for the first time in, in, in Mexico or, or in Latin America. And that is quite remarkable. Uh, Crucial Watene, uh, she's an associate professor in the School of Humanities, Media, and Creative Communications at Mass University. In her research, uh, addresses fundamental questions in moral and, and political philosophy, particularly those related to well being, development, and justice. Uh, her primary areas of expertise include mainstream uh, theory of uh, well being and justice, especially the, the capability approach obligations to future generations and indigenous, especially Maori uh, philosophies. Uh, her research pioneers high level discussions of indigenous concepts in global justice uh, uh, theorizing, grounded in research that demonstrates the central role of local indigenous communities. And Crucia will be talking to us today uh, about indigenous philosophies and global justice. Thank you so much Crucia for being here and please welcome. Uh, kia ora tata. It's really lovely to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much um, and congratulations on such a great and important event. Um, so I'm zooming in from Otahuhu College right now, which is the high school that I attended many years ago uh, in South Auckland. And I'm here as part of a research project that I'm involved in that's concerned with reconnecting Maori youth with their ancestral marae, their homelands. Uh, because most of uh, the descendants now live away from their kin community or marae centers. Um, and so understanding how we can reconnect to this community, this uh, diaspora relies on the cultural needs and aspirations of our youth, of our Maori youth, as well as those who remain at home. And so there's this need to, in this particular project, in the context I'm in right now, there's this need to bring together the cultural needs of our home communities for people again, for their descendants to come home and to be connected, and the need that our descendant community, wherever they are in the world or in the country, have for their connections to, to home. And so this need to bridge communities is something that I wanted to talk a little bit about today, um, but different kinds of communities, knowledge communities. So I wanted just to reflect on this growing global narrative around the role of indigenous communities for charting global environmental change. And I take this narrative, I mean, the narrative you find in lots of global UN reports at the moment, but I take it from the recently released um, United Nations Development Program, Human Development Reports of 2020, which I was um, an advisory board member for. So the Human Development Reports have long sought to challenge conventional thinking about how to conceptualize and measure development. And the first report, which was published in 1990 and led by Mabubul Haq, took aim at the idea of equating growth in GDP, of course. And so the report introduced what's known as the Human, Human Development Index or the HDI as an alternative measure. And it's a simple average of national, of, of a nation's income, life expectancy and um, educational opportunities. So, you know, far from perfect itself, but something that moves beyond economic growth alone. And the latest report, The Next Frontier, uh, Human Development in the Anthropocene, argues that development that harms the planet is not development at all. So the report sets out a whole range of ideas for transforming the way that we work and live together uh, to ease our ever tightening grip on nature and on the planet. Um, importantly, the report argues that indigenous peoples have a fundamental role to play in this, in this transformation toward planetary well-being and justice, and that this is really urgent. 
Um, we know that indigenous people manage between 20 to 25% of the la planet's land mass, an area that includes upwards of 40% of global protected areas, and that this land is vital in protecting what is left of our biodiversity. What's more, indigenous knowledge, which has been developed over many generations, offers insights into the conservation of species ecosystems. And so the report highlights the need to instill a sense of stewardship rather than ownership of nature. And it takes indigenous communities to be central to driving this transformation. Um, I want to make a couple of points. First, that there's a need for recognizing indigenous philosophies in doing this, right, in doing this well. Um, because while this global narrative is shining a light on various ways in which indigenous communities can contribute to the need for sustainable pathways, indigenous peoples have been driving dialogue about better understandings of owning and development and justice for some time. And that's because for me, and often um, with very little support, right? For many indigenous peoples, good relationships are fundamental to a well-functioning society. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, these connections, these relationships are captured in Māori narratives, charting our connections with people in other parts of the natural world. And the relationships are woven in a complex genealogical network. Indigenous well-being begins at the socio-environmental intersections of these relationships. And so these intersections, the places where, where our relationship, where we meet uh, people and, and the planet and nature, they generate responsibilities for remembering what has come before us, for realizing well-being today, and for creating the conditions for the pursuit of even better futures tomorrow. And so practices that nurture and enhance the importance of these relationships are central to Māori notions of uh, manaakitanga, for instance, practices of caring and supporting others, and kaitiakitanga, practices of social environmental stewardship or trusteeship. And we find these commitments and practices in marae communities and tribal groups across, across the country. But we also find this, this idea of good relationships as being at the heart of, of indigenous practices and philosophies all over the world. So similarly, um, the Yaru people of Broome in Northwestern Australia contend that connections with other people in the natural environment play a central role in what's known as mabulion or living a good life. Um, relationships as well as the need for cooperation and justice between all beings are set to ground the Nishinaabe good living concept of Minabi Mariziwan. And of course, reciprocity and relationality and in human interactions with nature is fundamental to the Quechua people of Peru's good living notion of Alan Corse. And I take that term from my, my good friend Maria Elena Juan who does lots of work with them. For indigenous peoples everywhere, navigating our complex responsibilities for people and other living things in ways that enrich our existence is fundamental to leading lives that we have reason to value. So here, indigenous philosophies are central. Um, and what's interesting is, and, and I'll go and talk, talk more about this, the place that we're trying to get globally, the narrative that we're trying to now generate globally to aim for is where indigenous philosophies begin. Um, much of our thinking, for instance, mainstream thinking about the value of the natural environment um, tended to think, to begin with, um, with the idea that human well-being matters, so it was anthropocentric. And then the strategy in mainstream thinking about this is to say, well, how do we extend our scope of concern? We start with human beings, then we need to include non-human animals, and then we need to extend it even further to different natural entities. Um, but indigenous philosophy begins in a different place, um, and that's because indigenous philosophies tend to begin with this, this uh, default notion that everything matters in some way. And so then the challenge is to figure out how things matter, how they fit together within a network of relationships, how we navigate the challenges that arise within these relationships as they shift over time, and how our practices impact on those relationships, and then also what decisions we have to make given that we want to ensure that we enhance the relationships that exist between people and between people and nature. And so it makes sense that when you begin with a story about social environmental relationships and not ownership of land and natural entities, but relationships, that this idea of stewardship and collective flourishing runs at the heart of the philosophy. 
And so what falls out of this notion is this idea of what I really like, this idea of collective continuance, which we find in the work of an indigenous philosopher, Kyle White, Anishinaabe indigenous philosopher. And here, what we say is what really matters is our capability for collective continuance to protect and nurture a community's capacity to thrive well into the future. And I take this to be absolutely central to what the report is trying to do, what the human development report is trying to do. It's trying to bring to life this notion that we are a part of a much larger journey of intergenerational and planetary well-being. And that if we can imagine ourselves as being an important part of that larger story or legacy, if we can somehow imagine our lives as being connected to the past and to a future that we'll never live to see ourselves, then we uh, rethink our ideas about development in radical ways and we rethink the purpose of development generally. Um, because for indigenous philosophy, we're all connected in intimate ways. And by transforming the way we live together, we can create the kinds of environments that, that enable us to live together sustainably now and in the future. And if we can recognize the role of indigenous philosophies in creating um, and charging that change, then I think the global narrative gets us is, is better positioned to make any kind, of, any kind of transformation that it's aiming to do by recognizing indigenous philosophies. But then we also need to recognize that that philosophy and that and enabling indigenous communities to practice that philosophy has to be built on just relationships. So justice matters for indigenous communities and for the kind of global narrative that, that we're seeing now. Um, so we've already said that we that, in, that indigenous peoples manage so much of the, the planet's landmass in so many protected areas, um, and that we find indigenous communities all over the world, from rainforests um, in Southeast Asia and Latin America, for instance, to communities in the Arctic and the Pacific. And it's not by chance that in some of the most biodiverse places on this planet, indigenous communities are responsible for taking care of those places and have developed practices for doing just that. But when we undertake work with and for indigenous communities, which justice requires that we do, that we develop just relationships, um, then we're ensuring that we're enabling those communities to do the work that they're not only really good at doing, but that's really valuable to them. That's really important part of, of their flourishing and their thriving and their identity and their survival, right? And we, we acknowledge the vital role that indigenous communities play in a, in a more just way um, and, that's, and that's important because many indigenous communities face barriers still, including limited land tenure and limited rights. Um, and so when it comes to protecting their homelands, um, implementing local and regional policies, as well as global targets. So again, this has to be in the global narrative that help to remove these barriers and promote partnerships will benefit everyone. That must be part of the narrative. And, that, and in some cases, that's recognizing the mere existence of indigenous peoples around the world, the fact that we exist. In other cases, it's also recognizing the work that these communities do on living landscapes and protecting the natural environment. It's recognizing the importance of language and practices for biodiversity protection, so biocultural diversity, the link between biological diversity and cultural diversity and the role that language plays in carrying that knowledge. And this is what's required for enabling indigenous philosophies and practices, for truly enabling them, of which stewardship notions, which we find in this global narrative, are somehow now central. And it's only, it's only now, it's only once we undertake this, approach this idea that indigenous philosophies are fundamental and that just relationships have to be developed it's only then that we'll be able to reimagine how we might live better lives on this planet um, a deeper reason of course that falls out of that is that um, we recognize the practices developed by these communities as grounded in intimate place-based connections and values and it's here that the sense of stewardship is truly located in these place-based attachments and values. And this is where my research and where I am right now with, with the students in the Wānanga units of Otahuhu College, where that really comes to life in local communities of reconnecting our, our young people with their homelands and with their philosophies and with their practices and with their, this, this legacy that they are part of, this ancestral legacy um, that that grounds the way in which we might, might live our lives and create better futures.
features for everyone. So supporting Indigenous communities by removing barriers, all sorts of barriers to, to pursuing all sorts of futures, sustainable futures, sustainable language um, is now really vital. Um, and we can, we can at least an Indigenous play a leading role in this, in this global narrative that, that we want them to play if we, if we ensure that we're enabling them to do just that. Um, so the pursuit and realization of our global goals are intimately connected to and dependent on local indigenous communities. Um, the global narrative is right about that. But reducing the gap between this global narrative and the realities of indigenous, local indigenous communities and the importance of their philosophies and practices and justice requires our urgent attention. And we won't manage to do that unless we recognize the central role of indigenous philosophies and the need for justice for those communities, we won't be able to achieve this global, the global transformation that is becoming more urgent um, every day. Kia ora. Kia ora, uh, Thank you so much for such a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, it's what a privilege to, to have you here and to, to get your perspective and uh, uh, our conversation is, is so enriched now. And I have the, the pleasure of introducing our um, two speakers from, from UNAM, uh, Margarita Petrovic. Uh, she's a Serbian linguist and a PhD candidate in Mesoamerica studies from, the, from, from UNAM, where she also received her uh, master's in her double BA in linguistics and Spanish language and literature, both from, from the University of Belgrade. Currently, she is a professor of social linguistics and linguistic anthropology at the Faculty of Political and Social Science at UNAM. And has taught at the National School of Anthropology and History. Her research focuses on the topics of language, contact between Nahuatl and Spanish, and the documentation was at Eastern Nahuatl. And she is the author of various publications in Serbian, Spanish, and uh, English. And we also have um, Dr. Salvador Reyes, who's a Mexican historian with a PhD in Mesoamerican studies from uh, UNAM. Uh, currently, uh, he is a researcher at the Institute of Bibliographical uh, Studies of the same university and a professor at the National School of Anthropology and History. And he was editor of the Estudio de Cultura Nahuatl and has specialized in Nahuatl documentary sources, especially uh, those that express the local conception of nature and plants. He has published on the topics of forest, amaranth, uh, beans, and squash among the Nahua. Besides, his publications include the translation, editing, and study of the manuscript Cantares Mexicanos in collaboration with the late Miguel Leon Portilla. It's such a pleasure uh, having you both here. Uh, welcome welcome to, to the colloquium. Thanks a lot. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. A real pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Uh, Professor Reyes Kiwas and I wish to thank you uh, for the kind invitation. Um, our presentation is entitled The Nahuatl Language, uh, Mexican Historical and Cultural Heritage. And it is organized in the following way. After uh, the introduction, we are going to give historical and patrimonial overview of Nahuatl across different historical periods, pre-Hispanic, colonial, uh, Mexican independence, and modern times. Uh, under, under the Constitution, uh, Mexico stands for a pluricultural country, with its 68 indigenous languages recognized as national. The main argument for this is the fact that their origin precedes the Constitution of Mexican states. Therefore, all the production, both written and oral, is considered an essential part of Mexican cultural heritage. Under this provision, the government should promote, preserve, and guarantee access to legal health and education services in indigenous languages, as it is prescribed in the national law on indigenous languages. Despite the official policy and the long list of best wishes, the reality for people speaking these languages is quite different. The hegemonic position of Spanish, which serves as a vehicle of racism and inequity, 
the discrimination and marginalization of indigenous peoples have caused many languages to be in immediate danger of extinction. Under those circumstances, no one was privileged for many reasons. Firstly, because of its long history of writing, which can be traced from the very beginning, from the autochthonous pre Hispanic writing system to the introduction of Latin alphabets, and all the way up to its current use in the digital world. Secondly, Nahuatl was used as a lingua franca for political reasons even before the Spanish conquest. Nahuatl's uh, supremacy in North America continued after conquest and was even fostered by Spaniards who use it in administration and evangelization. Furthermore, uh, each 1.6 speakers, a million speakers are a number that exceeds any other indigenous language in Mexico. Unfortunately, this is not a guarantee of its vitality due to population dispersion, great dialect, uh, dialectal diversity, and the lack of standard language. These conditions uh, require to be addressed uh, in terms of vigor and durability uh, of Nahuatl as they are making it even more fragile in the face of language shifts. Uh, Nahuatl is part of the Nahuatl linguistic family, originated in what is now the West Central region of the United States. Its long history dates back to about 5,000 years when it started the differentiation of the Yuranawan or Yura second family uh, from its ancestor. Uh, sorry, uh, the Yuranawan and the family is divided into two subfamilies. The northern one spoken only in the United States, sorry, uh, and the southern one located in Mexico and El Salvador, except for Pima and Yaki, spoken both in Arizona and Sonora. The Nahuatl group is made up of the extinct uh, Pochitec, which was spoken in present-day Oaxaca and for Nahuatl, uh, which is divided into Pipil and Nahuatl. General Nahuatl comprises 30 variants distributed in 16 states. According to the National Institute of uh, Statistics and Geography, there were approximately 1.6 million Nahuatl-speaking population uh, in, two, uh, uh, in 2020 which makes 23.4 of all indigenous speakers in Mexico. Uh, the Nahuatl uh, the Nahuatl dialects are usually grouped into three major dialect areas, uh, Central, Western, and Eastern. And uh, the long history of Nahuatl migration largely explains the diversity of this language. Uh, Nahuatl in pre-Hispanic times. Well, uh, the immediate ancestor of Nahuatl group Protonawa Pochutec originated in the northwestern region of Mexico when Mesoamerica was experiencing the changes of urbanization during the pre-classic pre period, which goes from 2500 to 150 BC. And that's when the first contact between the Nahuas and the ancient Mesoamerican cultures occurred. The Nahuan integration into Mesoamerica entailed their participation in the cultural spectrum during the classic period, from 100 to 900 AD, to the extent to believe that they played the central role in the cosmopolitan city of Teotihuacan, coexisting with diverse peoples and languages such as the Arami, Totonac, Huastec, Purepecha, Zapotec, and Maya. This multiculturalism of the Mesoamerican peoples nurtured the Nahuan culture through the adoption of their calendarical and vigesimal numeral systems. In Teotihuacan, a writing system was developed that gathered together conceptual instruments from the Olmec and Tapote cultures, establishing what may be the oldest records of the Nahuatl language. During the classic period, Mesoamerica spread to the north, with cities such as La Quemada and Teotihuacan, where the Nahuas continued to arrive, attracted by their urban life, extensive trade, and uh, archaeology depicts uh, the splendor of the northern uh, area of Mesoamerica and the trade routes between this region and Arido America. At the end of classic period, from 600 to 900 AD, internal conflicts gave rise to the decline and abandonment of the Tihuacan and its urban centers, 
which coincided with the crisis in the Mayan area. This development led to the flourishing of cities such as Cholula, Xochicalco, and Chula, seat of one of the most important Nahuan groups, the Toltecs, who adopted the Teotihuacan tradition uh, mixed with the culture of the migrating peoples from the north, Aranawas and Otomi, known as Chichimex, a derogatory generic name for se semi nomadic groups that wore animal skin, clothing, and used bows and arrows. The Chichimex put Toltecs south towards uh, the Mayan area, uh, permeating their influence, as can be seen in codices and cities such as Chichen Itza. We believe that during this time, the Western Nahuan peoples migrated to the Gulf, originating the Eastern Nahuatl, whose speakers subsequently migrated to Central America, giving rise to the Pipil language. Then, with a uh, civil strife in Tula, the Toltecs negotiated uh, with the Chichimex the establishment of new political uh, powers. Uh, this was the distinctive trait of the following post classic period, where alliances such as these led to the funding of uh, cities like Texcoco and Mexico Tenochtitlan after the historical mythical pilgrimage from the north. The alliance of now on cities of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan subdued many other peoples, extending their rule across the entire territory. The political structure of this alliance was implemented by establishing administrative enclaves, enclaves in towns where, speak, where people spoke other languages, promoting, promoting the dissemination of Nahuatl. Thus, uh, the Nahuatl language became lingua franca, the means of communication among the speakers who had no language in common. Also, its writing system uh, recorded the text the text burden in codices and the conquest linger in archaeological pieces and wall paintings. After the uh, colonial period, after the military conquest, the spiritual, spiritual conquest resorted to language to subdue the population. The friars in their missionary outreach undertook the task of getting to know and describing the, uh, the Amerindian languages in order to root out from the indigenous minds their religious thinking. The first language that drew uh, the friars' attention was Nahuatl, giving it political rank. Language arts and vocabularies were the fruit of, other, of, of their eagerness to produce doctrinal texts in Nahuatl later on. Tapping on into the already broad dissemination of Nahuatl, many Mesoamerican peoples were evangelized in this language. Uh, the civil uh, administration uh, benefited from these written work, which helped in uh, implementing the norms uh, to regulate the social life, as well as like land petitions and tribute appraisals that today represent historical testimony. Uh, the introduction of, alphabet, of the alphabet fostered the creation of a new written culture that has bequeathed us thousands of documents. The Nahuas did not remain passive in building the new colonial order. Uh, due to the missionary education, a social sector of Latinized indigenous people uh, emerged, an intellectual elite that did their utmost to preserve the formal knowledge of their ancestors. Concerning transferring them to writing and printing, remaining that tradition, I quote, trapped in the shiny prison of the alphabet, uh, end of quote, is Garibay says. The doom of Tula, the escape of Tetracorato, the stories of pilgrimages, songs, and other traditions from the times were finally written. Besides, the new elite participated in the construction of the Guadalupana myth, but also had access, access to the Greco Latin heritage. For example, they translated Aesop's, Aesop's uh, fables into Nahuatl, adapting the fauna of the original stories to the Mexican fauna. Writing complemented the ancient orality 
repository of memory and ancient knowledge. The Nawas tried to maintain this dynamic in colonial times, combining their system with the alphabet, creating new hieroglyphics suited to the new era. There are a, a myriad of mixed codices that combine our writing with system with the alphabet in Latin, Spanish, Nahuatl, and other Amerindian languages. The written language portrays part of the spoken language evolution. According to Lockhart, during the first decades of the colonization between uh, 1519 to 1540 or 50, Nahuatl and Spanish uh, had little influence on each other uh, is with is each one used its own resources to express new concepts and uh, reality. For example, cucumber was uh, introduced to the new world by Spaniards who designated uh, this concept was designated by the Nahuas as squash, which is eaten raw, or in Nahuatl ayatotli, so cacualoni. Or we have another neologism. Uh, what they kill for water over somebody's head for a baptize. And this is according to Lockhart 2019 in the first edition 1992. A relatively small Nahuatl population started to use the Nahuatl alphabetic writing, producing the first text in collaboration with the friars around 1545. In the second period of Nahuatl Spanish contact, Long words from Spanish multiplied, substituting native creations from the previous period. For example, in early text, the term masato, deer, was used to refer to the horse. But for the second period, the text already used adopted long words cavallo or even yegua or caballo yegua. Uh, phonological adaptation of borrowings can, uh, can be found even in hieroglyphic writing. Uh, one of the illustrative examples is the hieroglyphic expression of the Viceroy Mendoza. Uh, here we have uh, his name in this part, uh, made of the elements of uh, maguey, metal, itosatl, which means mold. Uh, and this combination uh, gives us Metusa for his name, Mendoza. Uh, during this second period, sorry, uh, the written culture expanded to regional centers and, and the projects started in the first period, such as Lagoon's Florentine Codex, were completed. Also, two versions of Molina's vocabulary, 1555 and, and 1571, were printed. From this period, uh, date one of the uh, earliest grammars of the Nahuatl language, known as Artes, uh, la, the first one, Arte de la Lengua Mexicana by Andres de Olmos uh, in 1547, Molinas in 1571, and by uh, the last one by Antonio de la Rincón, a native mestizo of the Foco, in 1595. The long words which can be identified in this document allow us to learn how the Nahuas appropriated Spanish culture. An example of this appropriation is a uh, substitution of the bidecimal numeral system for decimal one, or the use of Spanish names for days and months, uh, modifying the parameters of time measurements. Um, Lockhart's third period spans from the 1650s to the present, and it is characterized by extensive bilingualism, massive intrusion, of Spanish uh, vocabulary into Nahuatl, including both basic vocabulary and functional grammatical words, such as conjunctions and prepositions. Unlike the previous period, uh, in this one have occurred profound structural and typological changes. For example, the extension of plural suffix to, uh, in, to animate, inanimate uh, nouns, uh, sorry, uh, the absolutive and possessive day leveling, the use of analytic forms instead of the expected synthetic. Um, from the end of the 17th century uh, and throughout the 18th, the Nova people were required to prove before the authorities the legal possession of their land. 
to do so, they developed a set of, a set of codices generically called the Tialoya, in which they went back to the Pakistani past to support their arguments. Perhaps the Tialoya uh, constitute the last record in which they combine their autochthonous writing system with the alphabet and the reality with written culture. But in the end of Mexico, the convoluted Mexican 19th century not only did not tackle the economic and social uh, lack, uh, sorry, uh, lack indigenous peoples underwent since colonial times, but it is very likely that the situation for them had worsened. The economic crisis, invasions, and internal wars were the price to pay for the fight for equality. However, the revolutionary ideals were far uh, from material, materializing in the same way amongst the Creoles, Mestizos, and indigenous people. The law of confiscation of property affected not only the church, but also the, the communities. Conversely, the pro-indigenous imperial government of Maximiliano issued nine decrees in our law that provided for the restitution of communal lands to their original owners. There were also liberal Nawas that joined the fight against the empire with clear denunciations aimed at strengthening the internal life of the indigenous people, uh, such as the case of Juan Francisco Lucas, the liberal leader of the Sierra Norte of Puebla, who proclaimed and called for the abolition of the time and corporal punishment, secular education implementation and respect for communal properties. The revolution brought uh, some changes for the indigenous people. The Latifundia disappeared and the agrarian reform established the Ejido, which somewhat restored the standard of living of the indigenous peoples. In the field of culture, the revolution produced an integrationist uh, educational project that uh, ultimately turned out to be negative for the indigenous people, peoples because it did not take into account the linguistic diversity as a benefit, but as a problem to be solved, uh, which caused the weakening of indigenous languages and illiteracy among this sector. And uh, for the last, uh, the present era, uh, the Zapatista movement at the end of the 20th century promoted creative force and self-management amongst in indigenous peoples. Apart from the institutions, the communities have allocated their own resources to promote cultural and linguistic revitalization projects. The political pressure indigenous peoples have exerted on the state had, for, had forced it to recognize the value of these cultures and their languages. Institutions promote bilingual and bicultural education. Laws have been translated into many Mexican languages, while in the case of Nahuatl, the National Institute of Indigenous Languages promotes orthographic norms uh, to create a standardized written variant that strengthens the language. But these provisions can be addressed by a quite small number of speakers, since the vast majority can write in Spanish, but not in our home. After the revolution, Mexico has undergone a significant urbanization, displacing millions of peasants, uh, most of them indigenous, to the cities where they were marginalized socially, economically, and linguistically. Uh, as a consequence, there is the interruption of language transmission in order to prevent social contents. This reality calls into question the official statistics on the number of speakers, both monolingual and bilingual. Today, communication technologies offer new horizons for the history of Nahuatl. The digital world uh, represents uh, an unsuspected uh, forum for the interaction of speakers from different regions. We can see in websites, blogs, YouTube, and Facebook how groups and now one citizen initiatives are generating discussion for uh, on idiomatic expressions and their variants, standardization, uh, etc. And all of this represents uh, new documentation that enriches the historical documentary heritage previously mentioned. Nowadays, and I'm closing, uh, nowadays the digital world can provide a new life for the language. In the digital landscape, Orality and writing can access a stage for a renewed interaction in uh, multiple formats. Hopefully, the now one documentary digital re repositories will be consulted by the speakers themselves so as to have access to their vast and rich 
rich and cultural tradition as a natural part of their cultural heritage and added to the new digital expressions from their own conceptions and on their own terms. Uh, we'll, we would like to leave it here. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Ajita. Uh, in Salvador, uh, you obviously, I mean, there's so much there to, to unpack. We could uh, keep going on and on about this. And, and as we can see, language and philosophies are, are, are shaped you know, through history by, by communities, by, by politics. You know, there's a great deal of interaction between, between them and, and power, for instance. And we know that the, the, the conquest of uh, of America or of New Zealand was not was a process carried out by, by force, but also by 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 texts, no, by by, by language, you know, what some critics call the, the armature of conquest, you know, the legal texts or, or religious texts, for instance. So it's interesting to reconceptualize you know, these these ideas and to bring them to, to, to the fore. So thank you so much for for that. And uh, we have uh, a couple of questions here for uh, Crucial. Uh, she's already uh, replied to that one, but um, Crucial is, um, is back. I know that she's at her uh, first alma mater. She went back to, to her school uh, because there are many alma maters, I guess. So she's, she's working there with the, the youth, with students at her, her local school. So it's, it's wonderful that she can be here with us. Crucial, um, Priscilla was asking about, uh, um, about Maori philosophers um, that, that you could recommend or books that uh, particularly deal with uh, environmental issues. That would be one question. And the other question also for, for Priscilla will be, uh, if we can talk about uh, indigenous philosophy uh, as an umbrella, uh, considering that uh, there are different iwis here in, um, in New Zealand, Aotearoa. Yep, so on the first, um, I think I made some comments in the chat, but yeah, great question. So typically it's, it's, a not, it's difficult to talk about um, Māori philosophers, right? So you, what we find in sort of mainstream philosophy is philosophy is attached to particular people. Somebody has a view, they lay that view out, other people challenge that view, and then you get people who are engaged in a conversation. But when we're thinking about, I think, Māori philosophy and, and also other indigenous philosophies, if I can use that now uh, for the time being, um, what we have are ideas that grow with communities of people, right, through practices and through language. And so there's a, a, a I, I would say there's a richer way in which we can kind of think about and understand and search for that philosophy. And that helps to explain why ideas about kaitiakitanga, for instance, you can find not principally in philosophy disciplines, but in all the disciplines. Um, you can find them uh, ideas about kaitiakitanga within communities and their different documents. So, for instance, environmental management plans that different iwi develop for themselves in their, their localized context. Um, you can find it in the work of anthropologists like, for instance, Mirata Kafaru, who, um, who has a wonderful book, Fenua. You can find it in, in rich kind of education theory. Uh, you can even find it in, in art forms and carvings and weaving. And you can, there's a wonderful, for instance, uh, short film that was created uh, by uh, Silla Wehi and a team of carvers that thinks about kaitiakitanga and environmental philosophies, uh, that indigenous environmental philosophies uh, applied to new places. So there's a range of ways in which we, um, we express that philosophy. And so there's a, a number of places that you find it. Yeah, so that's, that's the first, yeah. And I mean, of course, I think um, it's just useful to use indigenous philosophies, right? It's useful to, to use it that way. But of course, um, I, we, what we'd like to be if we talk about Maori philosophy is that there's a core thread, right? That unites it, but it's expressed or, so if we think about it this way, so let's say that we have this notion of kaitiakitanga and that that holds together a bundle of concepts that, are, that relate to each other in a network and that different communities because of their context, um, that, that bundle moves in different ways, right? But the bundle uh, and the core thread uh, remains uh, the same, we can say that, or just shifts 
or moves as it needs to through time and uh, dependent on the places and the people and the practices that evolve. So I think it's a useful way, Māori philosophies, but I mean, we, of course, again, it's that conversation between um, different communities of knowledge or different narratives about sort of global and local, but also iwi and, um, and kind of uh, regional or national. So yeah, I think it's useful, uh, but it doesn't take away that these concepts are, are linked to intimate places and place-based connections. And that's at the heart of how we might understand those philosophies. Kia ora. Yeah. Great, thank you. And I have a question for the three of you um, about the role that in the, in, in the case of indigenous uh, uh, cultures, the role that cosmogony a place in shaping up, in this case, philosophy and also language. I know it's a, it might be too broad a question, but it'd be interesting to, to, to see how would you, whether cosmology will help conceptualize philosophy, philosophy for instance, or uh, um, impinge of language or shape uh, in, in transform language across time. I don't know who would like to start. I was going to let someone else start. Okay. Okay. Salvador or. Okay. Oh, okay. I, I think uh, the language is the board of the knowledge. We first think after speak. Uh, and in, in this sense, uh, we can understand another culture about the language. The language is the, is the window for, for, for dialogue, for knowledge and other people. Uh, it's obvious we in nowadays we need to redefine our culture or concepts or uh, culture, philosophy, literatures, because uh, uh, our concepts come from uh, from Webster. Nowadays uh, the reality is is so different. We need to take a uh, part of the universal culture. That's right. No, That's right. I, in this sense, uh, we need to know, to study the historical knowledge of, of these cultures, of these peoples. That's right. Yes. Yes, Crucial, you were going to. Can I go? Okay. I, that's, I, I, yeah, I, think, I think I agree with that. I wonder, though, whether, whether one might say that actually language and practice and thought are uh, integrated, thoroughly integrated. Um, I wonder, I mean, because, I mean, we might lose language, um, but we might still retain practices, right? Um, yeah, or, or concepts or, yeah. So I just wonder whether we need to, yeah, whether, it, whether we need to, to prioritize one over the other or whether we can see them as fitting together in a, as related in a particular way, right? As integrated, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. That's a question, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a big question. I know it takes time, it will take, I mean, forever, perhaps to go over that. But one of the examples, for instance, so Margita was talking about this, the idea that uh, there were no horses in America when the Spanish arrived, and all, so there was no war, war for horse. So they used the word for deer to describe horses first, and then they had the transliteration you know, to, to be able to name the thing that appeared in, in the landscape. It, 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 and it had many, many implications, political, economical, and, and, and so on. So language had to adapt to that. It was sometimes that in, the, um, in, 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 in Maori, I would say, you know, how long we have to adapt. For, in, for instance, oh, yeah. it, it would be impossible to understand, I would say, um, New Zealand cuisine without kumaras that come from America, no? Or without <laughs> without avocados or without bananas, no. Uh, um, this practical uh, uh, but essential the elements, no, that, that come from 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 overseas, that will have to be integrated into into the culture too, no. And find a way to to name it, no, and to relate to them, no? and that's why we have these wonderful wonderful uh, uh, products from 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 all over the world here in, in New Zealand. Yeah, interesting. Well, if you um, if we don't have any more questions, so I don't know, Margita, Salvador, and Crucial, if you have any final thoughts. 
Yes, I, I, I say, I, I think in nowadays, the national states uh, overcome, over, uh, it's over uh, under the cultures, indigenous cultures. Now the, the language is a political science over times. Yeah. In Mexico, the Spanish is a principal language. Yeah. For education, for get justice, for instance, now uh, these situations is is a hard situations. We yeah. can imagine a, a different future with the participations with indigenous peoples who take place uh, when when they take the power, okay. like a feminist or like a migrants, no. Yes, that's right. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Yes. Crucial, any final thoughts? Um, not only that I agree with <laughs> what you said, that, you know, um, all of these things, concepts and ideas and language and practices, um, you know, Indigenous communities need to be empowered to, to, to live the lives that they value that's when we benefit, you know, not when global narratives decide that it's helpful. <laughs> and, and I think um, we need to set, if we're gonna, if we're gonna generate global targets and goals and indicators, then, then they need to um, work in a way that really empowers our local and indigenous communities. Um, because that's the only way that um, that, that global narrative of stewardship um, which which recognizes indigenous communities is really going to make a difference. It's ever going to make a difference. Justice uh, lies at the heart of any of those global conversations. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Crucial and Margita and Salvador, uh, for, a, for, for a wonderful uh, conversation. And as I was saying, I mean, we're really happy that, I mean, sad because we're coming to the end of the colloquium, but, but happy because we, we managed to to come together with this this beautiful uh, and very meaningful um, panel. So thank you so much. And I think we just have the, the, some closing remarks at, at the end, but thank you again. Bye thank yeah. you. Thanks you so much thank you. for you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you all for our